interviews that Saint Jose Maria gave at the beginning of the in uh, during the interview, when she's being asked about the, the, the capacity that young people have to live the virtue of holy purity, he gives his answer, and <clears throat> at one point. He says, so look, anybody who's Christian can live union with Jesus Christ. Anybody who's Christian, no matter how young or old they are, can live the words that we pray at the foot of the altar. I will go unto the altar of God who gives joy to my youth. In Turibo, the, the Latin is in Turibo altare dei adei quilectificat juventutem meam, which in the extraordinary form of the Mass, which our Father said until his final days, those are, those are the first words that, that, of the Mass at the foot of the altar. Occasionally when a young person in the work goes to one of these Masses, they're always, they're always like, they always, the first reaction after the Mass is, hey, our father used to say that in his homilies, <laughs> that little line. <clears throat> well, he got it from the Mass. He got it, it was part of his prayer. It was part of the prayer, we might say, that came out of his Mass. And I think one of the things that we see when we learn from the life of our father is that his prayer was liturgical. His life was liturgical. <laughs> the interview that he gave was liturgical. <laughs> the liturgy was, 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 was part of, he drew from the liturgy. He, he drank from it, you could say. He lived from it. And so, Lord, in our time of prayer this morning, and, I, and Lent is a wonderful time for us to pray about our liturgical piety. <clears throat> and we ask you, Lord, and perhaps even, it's not even a struggle, but the, the, the church in her liturgy in Lent helps us so much with liturgical piety because so many of the, the prayers from the masses of Lent, they're, they're rich, they're, 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 they're chosen, the prayers are chosen specifically to help us to prepare for Easter. If we turn to the Gospels, as we start, we can see that <clears throat> when we're asked or when we're encouraged to take the liturgy seriously in the, in the sense of to have it be a fountain, a rich fountain for our spiritual lives, for our ascetical struggle, for our prayer, I think if we look at our, if we look at the life of our Lord, we see that we're just we're not just imitating Saint Jose Maria, <laughs> we're imitating Jesus Christ. And just as, I mean, there, there's examples, there's different examples we could point to, but just one would be in Chapter Seven of John's Gospel. <clears throat> there's this whole dialogue that's taking place within which our Lord will reveal something about himself within the context of the liturgical feast of the Jews. In chapter 7, now it's, by, by chapter 7, it's clear that the Jews want to kill our Lord. But the Feast of Tabernacles is at hand. And his brethren... These must be some of his brethren who are not fully convinced at this point. <clears throat> they kind of goad him on. You know, they say, why don't you go to the Feast of the Tabernacles, proclaim yourself openly to the world. That would be an awesome, I mean, they're, maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're thinking like this would be a great PR move. Right? It'd be a great PR stunt. To go to the, go to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a, it's a high feast of the Jewish people, and... There you could kind of show yourself openly to the world. Wouldn't that be awesome? They're saying this, John tells us, because they didn't believe in him. <clears throat> They're hoping for some sort of public spectacle. 
a public spectacle by which there would be a kind of I mean, maybe they they even see it as like a like a like a final showdown like you might see in a western movie enter into town and the the two sides finally shoot it out liturgically speaking in this case but that's not the way our lord works Our Lord almost, it seems like he almost says, my, that, you know, the, that's the way the world works. Because he, he says, your time is always here. <clears throat> my time has not yet come. The world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the feasts. My time has not fully come. And so our Lord waits. He remains in Galilee. How often in Rome we were told <laughs> the key to everything is patience. We need to be patient, <clears throat> patient in our formation, patient in our struggles. Patient in letting people absorb their formation, however they receive it, and to change. <coughs> Not indifferent, not sweeping things under the carpet, but patient. <clears throat> Our Lord, we could say here, is liturgical in the sense that he knows, he, knows how the, he knows the days of the festival. He knows there's seven days in the festival. He knows that at the high point of the festival, the last, the, the, this particular festival was a festival that commemorated the miracles that took place in the desert between Egypt and the Holy Land, the miracle of the water, drawing water from the rock, the miracle of the manna, right? the miracle of the bronze serpent. <clears throat> and th there were seven days in the festival, and each day of the festival, a different miracle was, was celebrated, was remembered. A, a different historical moment was remembered. And Lord, we don't, we don't know the debates. We don't know what, what, at least I don't know at this moment, what the reasons that the Pharisees or the scribes would give for going to this festival, but we could imagine that it would, it would be a way of reminding them of their, their history, their foundation as a nation, but also the promises of God and how he's faithful to his promises. <clears throat> and we can say that our Lord kind of respects the rhythm of this, of this liturgical feast. And that there's, there's rumor mongering going on because our Lord is not at the feast. We don't know who started those rumors, but that's not the primary concern of our prayer today. <coughs> but then we see that our Lord, in the middle of the feast, he shows up in the temple and he teaches. And Lord, if we could, in our own prayer, meditate on that point, if we could use that to help us understand liturgical piety, that you I mean, we could say that you show up in the liturgy to teach us. Just as you showed up in the temple and taught. Our Lord showed up in the temple when he was a boy at another liturgical feast and taught. <clears throat> and our Lord, we could say, we're in that season where we're preparing for the great festival, the great feast, the great liturgical action of our Lord suffering and dying on the cross in which he also wants to teach us how to live. And we can even 
use the, some of the Gospels from the last few days, right? How, I think it was on Thursday, the Gospel on Thursday, where our Lord says, anyone who wants to follow me must take up his cross daily. Anyone who wants to come after me must take up his cross daily and follow me. Why? Because whoever loses his life will find himself. The Gospels, the Church chooses the Gospels, whether we read the Gospels of the ordinary form or some, there's an app now where it's easy to read the Gospels from the extraordinary form. They're both chosen to help us to start to get into Lent, to look forward to the feast that's coming, Easter, so that Jesus can teach us We can, again, there's some theologians that even as they go through and they study the events of the Passover, the events of the Last Supper leading to the crucifixion, they say you can see that it's a liturgy. It's a liturgy because our Lord, the Passover is a liturgical feast. There were specific instructions that were given by the Lord to Moses on how to celebrate the Passover. And just one example, by the time it gets to, by the time we get to our Lord's, when our Lord is celebrating the Passover with the apostles, there's seven cups, right? Maybe, we are, maybe we've studied this in some of our classes, but there's seven cups of wine that are drunk during, you know, a specific cup with each course. <clears throat> and the biblical scholars have noted that during the Last Supper itself, our Lord only drinks six cups. <laughs> And of course, right at the moment where he's supposed to drink the seventh cup, which would finish the Passover, he leaves. We, they leave. He says, let's go. <laughs> let's go. And they go to the garden. And then there's the, you know, the garden in Gethsemane. Our Lord's arrested. <clears throat> there's the crucifixion. And then, of course, when he's offered the vinegar on the sponge, he says the opening, he says the prayer, that's the prayer of the seventh cup. It is finished. So that our so that the cruci the the the, Paso the the passion and death of our Lord itself is a liturgy. It's part of the liturgy of the Jewish people. But it's part of the liturgy of the Jewish people that our Lord, in living it the way he lives it. He creates a new great feast. <clears throat> and then, I think we can understand why, well, first of all, the church seeks to help us by giving the year a rhythm. We can understand why our Father encourages us, for example, in the way, your prayer should be liturgical. How I would like to see you using the Psalms and prayers from the Missal, rather than private prayers of your own choice. One time when uh, Pope Benedict was trying to explain this value, the value of liturgical prayers, he said, <clears throat> One of the ideas behind the liturgy is that there are concepts, there are truths, there are realities that we don't fully understand, right? There are mysteries that we are, our Lord wants us to enter into these mysteries. And sometimes it helps us to be, to be praying words that that signify mysteries 
that we don't fully understand because what we discover though is sometimes after praying it many, many, many times, we, we, we get an insight into the mystery or we see how this helps us in our spiritual struggle. So that our prayer is not just us saying things to our Lord. <clears throat> our prayer can also be our Lord telling us things. Our Lord tell, and our Lord speaks to us through the gospel, through the liturgy, and he gives us words that, are, that signify something that he wants us to enter into. And Pope Benedict would go on to say, and that's sometimes why it could be good that we use Latin, <laughs> in the, even in our prayer, because Latin helps to give us this sense of mystery, of a mystery that we're entering into. <clears throat> our father wrote in 1938 in relationship to this point in the way, he said, I'm not even going to write down any more lines from Psalms in my notebook because I love them all <laughs> and they all help me. <laughs> so I'm just going to open up the Psalms or take the Psalms from the Mass and pray them. <clears throat> and of course, if we were just to apply that to these first days of Lent already, I, mean, I think we can, if we, were, if we were to take these Psalms and see how they're in our Father's homilies, see how he used them to help him live presence of God. We can see there's an abundance of examples here. Cor contritum et humiliatum domine non despicias. Lord, a, 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 a contrite and humble heart, O Lord, you do not despise. Cor mundum crea in me Deus. Create a clean heart for me, O Lord. Exaudinos Domine, hear us, Lord. Doce me, Domine, teach us, Lord. These are all brief lines from Psalms that find their way into the liturgy in these first days of Lent. And our father commenting on his own use <clears throat> of the liturgy. Actually, once again, he quotes, he quotes these lines from the, the first lines from the mass. And he says, you know, every time I go to the foot of the altar, every time I start mass, I begin with this prayer. I begin with this prayer, offering myself to God who gives joy to my youth. It makes me feel young. I will never consider myself old. Why? Because the love of God constantly vivifies me. My youth will be constantly renewed like that of an angel, like that of an eagle. <clears throat> it's because I love freedom so much. Our, our father would say that this line that he prayed every day at mass, right? He, it, it, it entered into his mind, the way he thought, <coughs> the way he saw his life. It helps me to see that, that pride is what, le is what tempts me to see my commitments to Christ as a chain, as a heavy chain. It leads me to be humble and to have a joyful heart because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is freedom and love and unity. His yoke is the life that he wins for us on the cross. Lord, give us this capacity <clears throat> to, and Lord, we understand that also part of the way the Holy Spirit works is that each of us, each of us might in the context of our prayer taking the prayers of the Mass to our prayer, taking the Psalms, the Antiphons, whatever it might be, taking those to our prayer, each of us, you, the Holy Spirit, will inspire us in different ways 
to soak those <clears throat> to soak those those passages, those lines into our lives, to use them. To use them in the way we live, in the way we live, the presence of God. Maybe to help us with passwords as we go throughout the day. Or sometimes, lines from the liturgy, we, we note them down because we, we say, yeah, I, I want to spend some time in prayer on these lines. Lord, so that I can become more like you. <clears throat> Our Father also, for example, gave a great example of his devotion to the liturgy in <laughs> Christ is passing by. <laughs> One of his, you know, that my first meeting with the priest of Opus Dei, he, he gives me Christ is passing by and he says, you'll really like this book because it follows the rhythm of the year. It follows the great feast days of the year. And that in itself teaches us something. That our Father would even right, choose, arrange the book, arrange the homilies in the book following the liturgical year. The Church tells us <clears throat> That we do this, we, we have a liturgical year. They call it the, the, the high point of the, of the liturgical year is Easter. Because it also, it unfolds for us the mystery of Christ. We recall the, all the mysteries that are connected with the redemption. It's a way by which we start to learn the riches of the treasure chest that our Lord of graces, that our Lord has prepared for us. Making them present, not only in every year, but in every age. So that we can lay hold of those treasures. We can incorporate them into our lives. We can apply them to our time. We can even say <clears throat> you know, sometimes people look at other religions and they'll say, you know, you, you could learn from that religion. Well, I guess now the big, the big example is Islam, right? They, they, they pray five times a day. But the more people are studying it, the more they're discovering that, well, actually, I mean, it's funny now, I've met a scholar in Poland, a guy in South Bend, there's a scholar in Cornell, and now an Iranian woman in France, Atala, <laughs> they all come, they've all come to the same conclusion, right? That the opening, you know, the, the pa many of the, the opening passages of the Quran, the opening prayers of the Quran, they're, they're ancient Christian prayers. They're ancient Syriac Christian prayers. And where did, the, where did they get this idea of praying five times a day? They got it from the breviary. They got it from early breviaries early Christian breviaries that had, that had marked out five times during the day for the, mostly for the you know, people who were living in the desert and the monks and the whatnot, but it's basically just an imitation of what they saw around them to mark the rhythm of the day. Not that we're, I mean, we're not asked to pray the breviary as part of our vocation, but we can see that the first, that what this helps us to see, and maybe when we, you know, when we hear the minaret, or not, that, not that we hear minarets yet, <clears throat> but when we hear or we see or we're, we're aware of Islam, it could be a reminder for us of that, yes, the early Christians, they developed a kind of rhythm of prayer to their day. And their day became liturgical. Liturgical in that their day was filled with signs. What is the liturgy? It's signs and words that lead us to Jesus Christ. And their day became full of signs and words that would remind them of the presence of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Father. <clears throat> the 
this one scholar, this one, just as an aside, but this one Iranian scholar, Atala, uh, contacted a friend of mine because there was a, he did a video on Islam and Islam and Logos. And so she contacted him and they, she's basically an atheist. I mean, an atheist because she, she can't figure out how to reconcile Islam and modern science. So now they're in this big dialogue about, and she's in France studying the origins of Islam and discovering its Christian prayers. <clears throat> so now my friend has convinced her and her husband to at least become, they, they, they now say they believe in God because they believe in Logos. And Logos, of course, is Jesus Christ. And now they just, just yesterday or the day before, they returned to Iran because her father, who is an atheist, is about to die. And so she emailed my friend and said, what do we do? <laughs> so my friend said, my friend has been to Iran and he's been to the Catholic Church in Tehran. So he just said to, he just, he just said to them, uh, bring your father to Father Flannery. <laughs> <laughs> and have Father Flannery baptize him. <laughs> that will solve all your problems. <laughs> so we can pray for Atala and her father. That this liturgy takes place. <laughs> and we can turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we can also ask her to help us, to see, help us to draw concrete resolutions, to deepen our love for the liturgy, to deepen our use of the liturgy, to see it as a real source, a real well, an inexhaustible well for our mental prayer, for our presence of God, for our apostolate, that... <clears throat> Because it is such a wonderful, well, it's a, great, it's a great mystery that Jesus Christ himself has given us. Mary, help us. Help us to learn to use the liturgy to pray. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. <clears throat>